sharing goal. Fantastic. So welcome everybody to our fourth podcasting Skillshare, which is a part of SCAN Storyteller Collective. And for those of you who don't know, SCAN uh, stands for Scottish Communities Climate Action Network, which is supporting community-led action to address climate and nature emergency and work for a just, thriving and resilient Scotland. And um, the Storytellers Collective is um, very much an emerging group of Scotland-based storytellers who are using their creativity to amplify stories of community-led climate action. And we have the ambition to engage wider audiences in conversations around their concrete visions for a beautiful, irresistible change that can inspire our communities around Scotland. And we have a 1000 Better Stories podcast and um, story blog. And we welcome contributions um, to those um, in a variety of story formats from anybody that wants to do it. And we also currently offer mini grants to anyone who would like to make a contribution to either of these spaces. So um, get in touch um, with us if you'd like to find out about that. And all the information's on SCAN Storyteller Collective page. And you can get in touch with us uh, with, with, through SCAN Storyweaver uh, email on stories at scottishcommunitiescan.org. And we thought these podcasting skillshares um, would be a great um, idea to connect anybody who's involved in audio storytelling and interested in audio storytelling telling around community climate action and justice in, in Scotland. And we also run longer workshops on storytelling for social change in a variety of formats. So look out for these uh, on our Eventbrite. Uh, but that's the formalities over and I'm very excited today to um, uh, welcome um, our visitor from Down Under, uh, Mark Spencer of Climactic Collective, um, which is a podcasting network for and by climate community in Australia and New Zealand. And he's going to talk um, to us about his journey from a podcaster to a network builder and uh, perhaps give us a little bit of inspiration of some, for something that we might be able to create here in Scotland. Um, so something up for discussion. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Mark, and you probably want to start your screen sharing. Thank you very much, Casca. So uh, straight away, apologies for anyone expecting a lovely Australian or Kiwi accent. Sorry to be a disappointment in that regard. I am an American Kiwi. You're a Yankee Kiwi. Um, I've yeah, lived here most of my life, so I'm a Kiwi by, uh, by nature, if not by um, yeah accent or any of that stuff. I'm just going to make this nice and big and start with this splash page. So um, hugely excited that you guys are on, that there's this group of people over there in Scotland that are engaged with audio storytelling, that are also climate engaged, and you see an intersection between those two spaces. Um, God, how, how times have changed. Like a few years ago, it was like maybe... Maybe anyone will disagree with me, in which case that'll be a good thing. But I found it really hard to find any podcasts that were talking about climate in a consistent way. You'd, of course, I, and I, I looked, right? So I, I'm a podcast super fan. I've had headphones on my ears, on my head since I was 12 years old, and you just never see me without headphones on. And I was getting quite concerned about climate change about... Five years ago, I just moved to Melbourne, Australia. I'd been an English teacher in China for a couple of years before that. And I'd kind of seen firsthand ecological devastation. Uh, the city I was in in China was highly polluted. It had about five or six coal powered uh, power plants in the city itself. You never saw the blue sky. Everything was covered in coal dust. It was very much like the UK a hundred years ago. You know, you could you could see the moths changing color in front of your eyes. Um, so when I got to Melbourne, I was like, okay, good. Things things are okay over here now. The sky is blue. The air is sweet. And then I was starting to talk to people and they said, you know that it's not just, you know, local environmental destruction or climate change. That's, it's scary, right? It's it's the macro level. It's and, and you're not safe here in Australia. And in fact, in Australia, you're one of the biggest petro states in the world and you're contributing to this and that. And I started to get freaked out and wanted to learn more. So I could find one-offs or individual episodes from BBC shows or you know, podcasts from the States that were about climate, 
but never about what I could do, never about what was relevant to me, and never about sort of sustaining my own action that when I went along to my first protest or you know, talked to my first activists and became friends with them and, and took part in what they were doing, there was nothing that was kind of chicken soup for the climate activist soul. And it was nothing our stories told at our level to a fellow audience. So I thought I'll, I might be able to do something about that. Maybe I could create the show I want to hear. So I got together with someone else that I met online. I was in Melbourne. He was in regional Australia. And we started interviewing local people who were climate engaged. That was the climactic show that started uh, Earth Day, April 18th, 2018. Uh, so we're going on our third, fourth, fourth year now. Um, and yeah, since that time, since starting the show, I've joined a podcast hosting company called Omni Studio. We were bought by iHeartRadio last year, which is the big American audio corporation that I think they've got a presence in the UK. They're all over here in New Zealand. They're all over the States. Um, so I'm I'm the dog who caught the car where I'm the audio fan turned podcaster, turned current, you know, um, climate, uh, sorry, customer support guy, but I'm getting into product management there. So I'll soon be like ha helping corporates extract revenue from audio. So there's a little bit of uh, a mixed bag there, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm working in the space full time now. Um, my one show, the way it became a network was... I wanted other people to have an on-ramp into climate-engaged storytelling as well. If somebody wanted to tell a single story, if they wanted to have one interview with someone in their local community, I thought through my show, which you can see is down here, through this one little show, this could be a platform for other people. It doesn't have to be me on the show every week, but I was committed to making a weekly show. I thought consistency in this space is really important because I could find way too many other shows that started started really hot, started full of enthusiasm and excitement and fizzled out after a few episodes. And it was really disappointing to see because of course the topic is too important to give up on. So what, you know, what, what went wrong for these people that they stopped? And I can proudly say that, you know, in its fourth year, Climactic has stayed a weekly show throughout that entire time. And that's why we've got over 300 published episodes. Not because my output is huge, it's it's not. I've had periods of a lot of activity and periods of little activity, but because right from the start, we were a platform for other people. And the goal wasn't for me to be behind the mic, it was to get other people behind the mic. And uh, there's there's one of our members here who uh, is an example of someone who, who took that opportunity and ran with it. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Be more, more spotlight on you to come. Um, so many of these shows, things like the PenPod. PenPod is the Postgraduate Environment Network, and it's a student group at the University of Melbourne. They started on Climactic and have spun off onto their own show, the Doctors for the Environment Australia show. This is a show from my original co-founder, Sarah Curious, for myself and a, um, a PhD student in climate communication through comics. Uh, she's a very, very cool person. Uh, we just talk to people that we find interesting and then we talk about the conversation we had with them and what we learned from it. So I've, I was getting to the end of too many podcasts where it's like, that was interesting, but I can't remember what was interesting about it. And I can't tell anyone else what I learned from it. So we kind of try to combat that through the format itself. We've had a lot of shows come and go. And there is attrition. It's totally normal. Um, when you start a network, it is a complete numbers game. You will have one show that's consistently the biggest. It'll be the anchor show, the flagship show. You will have others peak and valley. They will have seasons. They will be on. They will be off. Um, but one thing we've done consistently with Climactic and then these other kind of curation shows is try to have a con – well, we, we are consistent. Something's out every single week. But what it is will be a variety. But our goal is highest quality if we can while being accessible and relatable and to shine a light on especially the Australia and New Zealand, the South Pacific climate community and, and inroads are being made into adding shows from Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Tuvalu, Kiribati, because we only hear about these 
island nations and their communities when it's journalists who are parachuted in after a tropical storm. We never actually hear what it's like from people on the ground living there uh, and their stories. So getting more things like climate ready stories, which is from the Laudan Mali, the arid region in the north of uh, the state of Victoria. I know you all know Victoria, it's in the news a lot at the moment because of the Australian Open and Novak Djokovic. Um, there's, it's great to see more sort of community embedded in its community first and climate through the lens of that community, rather than here's a story about climate change and how it's maybe tangentially applicable to you in your local town. Um, I think it's it's been a sort of successful experiment overall. We do have 15 active shows. We do have a few shows in hibernation. Um, we are adding shows. But what does it mean to be a network? What do we actually do? Well, we host regular events where people get to know each other. It's a little game we played where we had people on a call from these shows and we went through and told each other about our shows, kind of practiced that pitch of you get in a cab with someone or, you know, back in the day where we met in person, right? Or in a Zoom meeting like this, you got 60 seconds to introduce yourself. How do you describe your own show in a succinct, clear way? It can be quite hard. So we, we practice that to each other. Um, we tell each other what we like about our shows. We give constructive uh, feedback. Um, one thing that about being in this network is like, from step one, you agree to take feedback and we all get better at giving that feedback over time, but you also have to be willing to accept it. And so we've avoided any kind of stepped on toes or any hurt feelings um, up until today. So hopefully that streak will continue, but I'm sure it won't. Like any group of people, there will be politics. We actually did lose a show recently, um, not in any dramatic fashion, just uh, the show, which is based up in Byron Bay in New South Wales, which is quite a enclave of natural kind of organic-y crunchy granola stuff. There's been an element of difficulty around dealing with vaccines and mandates and everything. And they had someone on, the father of permaculture, David Holmgren. And David recently was in the news for taking part in uh, mandate protests in Melbourne. So I simply said to the host that, hey, you might want to think about going back to that episode, adding a bit of context and re-uploading the audio file just to say, hey, this was recorded before that happened. Here's the facts about it, or, or here's where to get more information about it. And the host decided instead to leave the group, but that's fine. He was taking his show in a more spiritual and sort of he's about to do a van trip across Australia. So we, we've had one show leave quite amicably. Um, so, but it kind of feels like a milestone. We're not a network until someone's left. <laughs> so the model for Climactic and what I was trying to do with it being a network from the start was to have it really, really wide at the bottom, to have it really open for uh, people who wanted to share a story, wanted to interview a neighbor, interview their, their cousin who was really involved in climate change, somewhere that you could put something that had a bit of an audience behind it. Or you could, you could test out your skills. You could do your very first recording. Um, someone, it could be their very first interview. So we would bring people in as wide as we could at the bottom. We would have a lot of collaboration happening within the collective. And then out of it would flow these great opportunities that people could graduate from us onto maybe working in the space, maybe being a professional podcaster, um, and I can tell you some examples of that that have happened. And in large part, this model, even though it might be a little confusing to kind of figure out what's going on here, it is that, you know, that kind of test tube that we want to take in all comers, let them sort themselves, and then really help accelerate those people out the top who, uh, who want to go somewhere with their podcasting skills. Um, that's a lot of text, so I'm going to really, really skip through it. But um, it's been a, a real journey of trying to develop what the identity of the collective is, what the network is. And I've tried to make it as collaborative with members as possible. But for many of the members, they're podcasters. They've got individual shows. And these shows to them are a hobby. They're a part-time thing. And sort of the, the task of creating a network wasn't what they signed up for. 
So while I tried to make it as collaborative as possible, that also meant I was expecting it to be collaborative. And there was many times over the last few years, I was disappointed in my expectations of collaboration. Um, so it's important to kind of, yeah, figure out what your expectations for people are and actually assess, is this realistic? Am I, am I asking too much of people? And if so, that it, it's okay to change those expectations. Um, sure, it's a great ideal having this super collaborative co-created network, but that's not the reality for people who are doing full-time jobs, doing a podcast on the side. Most of them, most of our members have, have kids as well, their parents, they also volunteer. These are all really good people. <laughs> so asking them to do even more than that in a space like digital audio and podcasting, to me, which many of whom it's it's like Greek, it's it's new to them. It's not the f- water they've been swimming in since they were 12. So I, sh- I should have in hindsight done a lot less of this and a lot more a sentence. We're, the, we're a podcast collective that are independent shows that everyone owns their own show and we focus on the Australian and New Zealand climate community. That's what I didn't know to say three years ago, but that's where I've got to now. Um, of course, there are many environmental groups out there and more every single day. Uh, everyone kind of sees their own response to the climate crisis being, I should start a group. Um, that's cool. I like how many groups we are getting out there. I did that as well. Uh, in hindsight, though, I absolutely would have joined a group instead of creating my own. I absolutely would have loved to find a uh, cli- uh, a podcast network that had an interest in being climate engaged, and I could have just created a show on their network and spent a lot less time pulling my hair out and figuring out how to do all this stuff from scratch by myself while trying to make it collaborative. Um, so there's a lot of groups out there, and they all have storytelling needs, and they all have messages to share, and is kind of creating your own podcast and then going to them and asking them to collaborate with you when they don't know how, maybe is that the best way? Or is it instead going to a UK structural engineers and say, hey, you've got expertise, you've got talent. Some of you are very good at speaking. Others, we're going to have to spend some time with you, but that's okay. Um, let's, Let's create a show with you. I can bring these skills and that I'm interested in audio and I'm going to learn things and learn as you go. And they're not, but they're going to provide the stories and the talent. And you're not going to have to reach out to people and book people and explain to them what you're doing every single time. So there's a a constellation of groups out there and you can become their commas person. And again, Simon, I might pick on you later for how you actually did that in practical terms. So here's our constellation of groups and partners within Australia. Um, This is our old logo when I was in Australia and we were all just Australian shows. We have our big NGOs here, our Australian Youth Climate Coalition, our uh, Forgotten, uh, Beyond Zero Emissions, Market Forces, all these groups that we've got, uh, podcast networks, excuse me, podcast networks and production houses that were our friends that we would do projects with, volunteer orgs. I was talking with Aska before about Climate for Change and uh, that that's coming to Scotland, which is great. I you know I was just at an event with um, Katarina Gaita, who was the founder of Climate for Change, just a few years ago. And you know, as soon as I I was telling everyone and their dog about the the climactic show and the the network I was building, and you know, we to this day uh, are just waiting for them to start a podcast uh, that we're going to be able to host for free and give a bunch of feedback and help and assistance to. But they also haven't had that person or those right people step up and say, I can do that. And so in hindsight, maybe I should have done that. Um, we work with, you know, my employer on the studio. We, we use Canva a lot and have a good relationship with them um, because the, the technical lead of Canva, I'm sure a lot of you know of, or maybe use Canva yourselves. It's Photoshop for design idiots like me. It makes it really easy. Um, the technical lead of Canva is the co-founder with his wife of a site called Share Waste, and that got started in Sydney, but I think it's worldwide. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, you guys have Share Waste locations in Scotland, and it's just a, a way of putting your name 
and a, on a pin on the map to say, I can take your food scraps because I got worm farms or chickens, or I can give food scraps and yeah, that can happen. So Canva has a cool kind of thread to it. And, and they were one of my first uh, interviews. And then, you know, uh, tech things like so pod page. So I'll show you in a bit the climactic website and how it looks more complicated and technical than it is. And I've built everything to be just as simple as possible. So one person who's not a web developer, not a technical person like myself can keep up with a network of over a dozen shows. These are the ways we kind of encourage uh, membership, uh, you know, people who are part of the collective to help each other. Um, we were leveraging, we're trying to leverage a lot, a tool called Podchaser, which is basically IMDB for podcasts. It's a way of having credits of your show, who's appeared on it, um, on which particular episodes. So it's a great way of, I've already said his name, so I'll use him as, as an example. Say you're doing some research on David Holmgren and you want to know what he's said before on various podcasts uh, to see his evolution into someone who attends anti-vax rallies. Um, you can easily track down, as long as the podcasts have said, yes, David Holmgren was on this episode. You can then find every episode of every podcast that David Holmgren's been on. And to use a positive example, um, there's you know some comedians or some you know celebrities I follow that I want to listen to the podcasts that they're on. And I might not know the podcast, but I know them. And I can go to this site and see, okay, where have they been? Um, all the rest is pretty simple stuff. We use Slack for our communications. We have collaborated on projects, which I'll talk about shortly. We do guest on each other's shows. Um, if you're, if you need to be off for a week and you have a consistent schedule and you don't want to disappoint your listeners and you don't want to rerun an old episode of yours, you can grab an episode of someone else's show and have a guest episode from them. It exposes your audience to their show. It shows your audience that you're part of a network and it's beyond just the one show. You get a break. Everyone wins. Um, you can do that whether you're in a network or not, of course. Um, it's really uh, well-received to reach out to a show and say, hey, I want to have a break. Can I run one of your episodes? And you know, nine times out of 10, they'll say yes. We use a bunch of tools. I don't need to get into it. This is a, an old um, slides I had prepared for the network themselves to show them what they had available to them. If there's any questions about any of those at the end or, or yeah, anything technical, feel free to email me. Um, I will share my email address at the end of this. So that's what Climactic is in a nutshell, or that was the intention of it. And after these next few slides, which I'll fly through and we'll be in questions in just uh, about three to five minutes. Um, so feel free now to start jotting down any questions you want to ask or popping them in the chat. I do just want to highlight that there are dedicated climate podcast networks out there that are capital P professional podcast networks. I'll talk a little bit about them in a second. Um, and Climactic isn't at that point. I definitely had that ambition. That ambition grew over time. Um, but where Climactic is at in 2022 is... Um, we're at that still incubator level. We're still a sandbox for people and we'll still take all comers, we'll host them for free. I've got that luxury because of my day job that I've got an account that I can just add all of your guys' shows if you wanted to. Um, because I think I think also a little bit, why not we're recorded? I won't say anything else on that with my day job. Uh, this is the shows on the Critical Frequency Network. Uh, this is uh, Amy Westervelt, and well, it's mainly Amy. She is a um, climate journalist. I've had some interactions with her personally. She can be quite prickly, uh, but the thing she's built is really cool. Um, she's got this show called Drilled, which is brilliant. It is, you know, okay. <laughs> Who is a fan of true crime or who knows like what's I've given it away now what's the number one podcast genre and is every single time you look at stats true crime how do you get people who care about true crime to care about climate change well you make a true crime show about 
what the fossil fuel industry knew when and the big cover up. And every season they do a different investigative topic. The latest was on BP and the Amazon. And it's fantastic. Um, so yeah, very, very good. And not all of these shows are climate engaged. Some of them are sort of, you know, shows from uh, creators who were uh, female identifying. Uh, some are about, you know, democracy topics and everything. But there is a professional network out there. They centralize ad sales. They kind of function in a way that these people are at least semi-professional podcasters some of them have the ambition of being full-time professional podcasters so that's like a bar of there is a network out there of quality climate engaged shows i definitely had my eyes on crooked media some of you guys might listen to pod save america or know about this network um there's also you know wondery that was bought for a billion dollars from amazon so there are professional networks out there I definitely had my eyes on and that now in the course of my day job I work with and you know climactic could have headed down that track but that requires a level of yeah professionalization and also structure and limitation being placed on members that at the end of the day I didn't didn't commit to doing um so just to just to compare what everything I've said about the network and real networks out there, this is what we're not. But there was definitely ambitions at the start. And yeah, just to say, like, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, and I haven't said anything about climate really except for my preamble. But of course, you all know this. But the media coverage of the climate crisis that is related back to our everyday lives is minuscule and piddling. And I love how much Don't Look Up has shown a light on how bad a job media does about this. But whenever people criticize media now, I do, even though I'm such a baby podcaster compared to anyone with you know a million of sized audience, but I make media and I know it's hard. So I, I am a bit more sympathetic for the plight of the media because you do want your content to be engaging for people to like it. And how hard is that with a topic like climate change? So um, I know it's a tightrope walk we all walk, but it matters. And uh, you're all doing yeoman's work. Uh, other things just to show you, this is my last slide. Um, one collaboration project that we did uh, with myself, Eve, that PhD student who does comics, my friend Sean Marsh, who's a, a brand designer. Um, he did a first season of his show. So a quick story about my friend, Sean Marsh. Um, Sean was the brand manager for a, a superannuation fund in Australia called Future Super. It's like a green super fund that doesn't invest in fossil fuels and weapons and all the amazing things that other superannuation funds do in Australia. Um, he had a, a project with them called not business as usual, which encouraged businesses to strike or allow their employees to, to strike along with the climate strikers back when the school strike started. They got hundreds of companies with tens of thousands of employees to commit to that. You know, all your typical suspects of Patagonia and Atlassian, all the sort of progressive companies, uh, but then a bunch you wouldn't expect. So I knew that Sean had, had an eye for this kind of thing. So uh, Sean, and I got together and, and had this campaign called Podcasters Declare. I'll just show it to you quickly, which is still up there. And it's something that you can all join as well if you'd like to put your names to it. I think many of you have, which I really appreciate. But we, um, we wanted to convince Apple to add a climate category to their podcast directory. Because right now, how do you find climate shows? It's word of mouth. It's very scattered. There is no central place. So we had 1,300 podcasters sign this letter. We got coverage in the New York Times and the ABC. It was, was freaking awesome. Apple didn't do anything, but I'm so proud of this campaign. And I've heard that, again, I'm being recorded and this is going online. So um, signs are positive that things will happen in future. Um, yeah, this is the kind of thing we we do out of the Climactic Collective because we've got to know each other and 
cool stuff happens. Um, other cool stuff in the podcasting space is the podcast taxonomy, which is I know how hard it is to talk about what's a role, what like what's a um, a producer, what what a, what how do I do credits? What should people get paid? So they've got a white paper here you download, and it is a a, a just a taxonomy. It is the definitions of all of these titles and roles and these words that, that are unfamiliar to us uh, when we just get started. But um, it, because podcasting is this melding of the radio industry, uh, elements of TV production, um, and the audiobook world as well, this is, yeah, fantastic. The partners that have pulled it together. I wonder if our team is on here. My, my name won't be, but I've contributed. Oh, no. See, my boss is there. And uh, yeah. I answered those questions. <laughs> um, it's a great resource. I'd highly recommend checking that out. And then podcasting seriously, which is just a small, it, it's kind of what you've got access through, through uh, scan, sc sc can, sc scan, uh, what the amazing thing that Casper yeah, pulled together. Yeah. Thank Scottish. you. <laughs> Yes, yes. And um, the grant funding and like the micro funding, which is so useful when you start a project, because what if you need a mic? What if you need some gear and you're just getting started? Like, are you going to do it all or, or you need to travel somewhere for an interview? Um, the Podcasting Seriously Fund has helped um, really deserving, really great shows pay for uh, entry to awards, which can be expensive and uh, basically help. Uh, again, this is this is a sort of female and gender diverse uh, focused awards fund, but just just showing you that yeah, there, there's cool stuff happening in the podcast industry, and it's not all um, all corporates yet. Um, that's the end of my slides. I hope that order made any sense, and and I'm super happy to answer any questions about what a podcast network is, or what it can be, or how to join one, or why you should. So um, yeah, happy to throw over to you guys for questions and I'll stop talking for a second. Thanks, Thanks Mark, so. that was amazing. Um, and there's so much, so much stuff in there to explore, possibly not, not, not enough time <laughs> today. Does anybody have qu any questions for Mark? Um, I might start by asking, is there any any mistakes that you might have made that you would recommend as to, you know, something that to avoid missteps or maybe Just positive you. steps? <laughs> yeah, tons, tons and tons. Um, I'm not sure how to avoid burnout. I definitely have hit burnout a few times. I'm, I'm glad that it's been recoverable from each time. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm super privileged though. I have had a job where I could work from home throughout the pandemic. Before the pandemic, I had jobs that were paying the bills so I could do this stuff in my free time. I had free time, didn't have kids, didn't, wasn't caring for anyone else, all these various things. But um, the best advice I probably got at the start was like, you know, find out what speed you can go and travel at that speed don't compare yourself to other people don't try to go as fast as you can at all possible moments um and yeah you know, just if you can avoid burnout do because it's not not productive at all i think um you know the times i've been on a sprint and feeling really good um very quickly give way to feelings of like having to keep up and you get speed wobbles and oh my god if I don't finish work and then do this edit for three hours which is such an intense process as you all know audio editing to do it well is a 100% focus job and if you do it for longer than an hour your brain's a puddle like uh, doing that and, and edit after work every day five days a week and then interviews on the weekends and scheduling and um if you find yourself doing something that's unsustainable, well, just, yeah, take take warning signs earlier than I did if you want to learn from my mistakes. Because um, it, it doesn't actually get you ahead. It's, it's reread the tortoise and the hare. <laughs> mm. 
Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I have two questions, if that's OK. Um, the first one is, what are your thoughts on video podcasts versus audio podcasts? And the second one is about gear and equipment. And if there's particular microphones you would recommend, maybe like a starter kit type thing. Yeah, yeah. Super quick answers to both of those and great questions. Um, video podcasts, I, I love them. Um, the recording tools are getting way better. One of the tools we use uh, is Riverside.fm, which is basically Zoom, but it does, um, it's basically the recording, the way it does the recordings is much better. It records your local audio and your guests local audio. It doesn't record this signal that's going sent across back and forth. It's um, independent of a bad internet connection and it also records the video. So I haven't done anything with it yet myself. A couple of shows I produce want to do video this coming season. So it's definitely something worth we're looking at. And if you, if you enjoy doing it, excellent. But it also, if you are filled with dread at the thought of having to produce video or be recorded yourself, don't do it. Um, do it if you want to. And it's not exactly, uh, it's, it's still very much a small subset of podcast listening is video podcasts over audio podcasts. So um, yeah, well worth experimenting with. And then gear. Um, yeah, don't spend too much money if you're just getting started. I bought in the UK, a Samson Q2U um, little, I've, I don't have it on me, but it's, it's like a handheld mic. It's got an XLR and a USB port on it. So you can plug it into your computer and use it fine for this. You can plug it into a, like a Zoom handheld recorder or any other type of recorder if you're out in the field. Um, they are less than hundred pounds, comes with a little tripod. Uh, it was the best birthday present my wife's ever got me. Um, yeah, uh, and, and then from there, the gear you get is gonna completely depend on what your use case is and what you need it for. So there's no kind of general rules around that. It's all context specific. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Hazel. Hi, um, just, I absolutely love the presentation and I'm really inspired. I, I wish that I could be part of something like that and have that kind of community um, among makers. And I wanted to ask you about if you had any tips for building community with your listeners. Because one thing that I struggle with sometimes is just getting responses from people 100%. who don't want to post on social media. Like I'm constantly like tweeting or saying, you get in touch with the show, tell me what you think. Um, putting out question tweets and people don't, I know people are listening to the show and people tell me sometimes when I see them, locally but um i'd love to have more of a community from my listeners so yeah that's yeah <laughs> question back to you while you got your mic on have you ever interacted with the podcast you listen to no i never do i don't even leave reviews. <laughs> so it, it is a small subset of people who are going to do that because there's there's more friction to do that than than posting on a facebook post or or anything like that because what are you doing when you listen to podcasts other things. What do you have to do to reach out to that face, uh, to that podcast? It's, it's a hundred percent focus. It's the active task and you, you're, you're driving your car you're, and you're not going to remember to do it later. Um, so the good news is things are changing a little bit. Um, Facebook is getting podcasts on it. So you can actually have people commenting in line at specific timestamps. I know that Facebook is a terrible platform and so many people are getting off it and I wish I could. Um, so that's not a silver bullet. Um, some concrete advice is don't just tell people you can, you, that they'll, they can reach out to you. As soon as someone does, or even if you kind of have to semi fake it at the start by having a friend do it or something, read out an email you got. Um, talk about an interaction you had with a listener on the show. Um, until it becomes, and until you introduce a little bit of fear of missing out or, oh, people are doing this. I, I'm listening to a show. I love it. I feel like a fan. These other people are interacting with Hazel, though. They're bigger fans than me. I want to show her that I'm as big a fan as these people. You kind of have to hijack people's limbic systems or whatever the part of the brain is that, you know, wants to feel part of the community and is is scared of missing out on because right now they're they're getting as much hazel attention as anyone else 
because you're not saying anyone else's name on the show and, and no one else, you're not singling anyone out. And unfortunately, to get people to want that, you're going to need to show people that, that you will do that, if that makes sense. Can, can I just jump in quickly as well? Because um, the, reason, the reason I am a contributor to Climactic and I've made eight episodes over about three years for, for Mark, the reason I did that is because I listened to four or five episodes and Mark in my ear whilst on a walk through the park said if you've got a climate story to tell this platform is for you it's, it's your platform um and although he was like he he didn't say you have to be in Australia and I was like screw it I'll try you know I'll I, I could do I could do an episode up so and, and I think it's also make, making it really accessible so again Mark will say on a show if you know we'd love to hear what you're up to send us a voice note you know send us a message on Facebook you know Facebook messenger send us a voice note and again it's like really quick and easy and simple and he's telling you that having just having just played you two or three other people's voice notes that might only be, be a minute or two long but they're just little snippets of you know we're working on this campaign here and and, and suddenly it feels like a community and it's dead easy to join it and be part of that and to get those first couple you have to pull people kicking and screaming to do it um you know as soon as i i was actively reaching out to people being like hey you're promoting this event please send me a voice message saying this facebook post that you've just posted because i i want to get more of that that texture more people's voices on the show I had to like, I literally went around to someone's house and held my phone in front of them to get them to say the words because people are also just like, no one else is trying to give them that platform. So it's, it's a new thing for a lot of people. Um, you know, Hazel, you're a fan of probably many podcasts, but you might not be part of the community of any because you've never sent a message. Like, it's hard, right? It's it's hard to get you to, to do it the first time. Um, Katie has been waiting patiently with her hand up. Thank you so much for that, Katie. No problem. I really hope my internet holds up. Um, if not, I can just type it in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Mark. I find this really, really interesting and really useful. Um, I'm curious to know, you mentioned that you guys within the collective provide feedback on each other's work, um, which I think is something I would find really useful and I'm just curious to know in really practical terms how do you go about that you know what is mm -hmm. the format for those sessions at what stage in the production process does that happen um and yeah how do you decide whose work is up for for feedback this week or this mm -hmm. month or whatever we've tried a few different formats um and it's sort of uh, I would love to have said we we picked a format, we stuck with it, and through consistency, it's become a normal thing. Unfortunately, it's happened in fits and starts. Definitely, the intention was it was for it to be that way. So I'm going to change my my uh, you know avoid burnout suggestion to instead practice consistency and you know plant seeds and just keep watering them until they grow. Don't expect uh, results overnight when you try something new um, because. Uh, we, we haven't done that. And so there, we, we've given people feedback at the ideas stage and, and helping them, you know, pick guests and decide on topics and decide on interview questions. That's just been a, you know, through Slack, just back and forth on text. We've also had listening sessions where we will listen to an edit. Um, whenever anyone has a comment, we'll pause that audio and we'll talk about it, what people are hearing, how they think it could be improved, what they're feeling at the time. Um, and the biggest kind of format uh, suggestion or, or advice is it's such a simple, basic thing, but the, the feedback sandwich or the compliment sandwich of like, you know, don't, don't do more than one negative in a row, do a, a positive and negative, a positive. Um, because when you've spent hours on something sitting alone in a room, you feel intensely vulnerable when other people are listening to it and you're actively asking for their critique. So um we've got people that are very aware of and, and generous about that but uh that's i've just taken that to heart as soon as i heard that and, and saw it used in practice is a 
is a compliment sandwich um, methodology when doing any kind of feedback. And I would love to have a better answer for how we've done it <laughs> because yeah, we've, we've just tried a few different ways and something I need to restart again this year. Thank you very much for the question. No, that's, Luckily, that's really useful. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay, maybe one more very quick question, if there's any, because we're coming to in 10 minutes too, and I wanted to make sure we've got um, time to reflect as well. I I do have a question, but it might not be a quick one. So no, can, I'll, I'll expect so, Mark to keep it. Brief. <laughs> <laughs> I it's it's slightly kind of playing devil's advocate as well, but I'm I'm curious to know why you think podcasting is a good medium for this stuff, because um, mm. it's something I wonder. I mean, I I love working in audio. I listen to a lot of podcasts myself, but actually, I don't know that many people who do um so yeah i'm just curious mm -hmm. to know what you think about that great question the quick answer is um compared to any other form of mass media podcasting is the smallest although in any given year i'm not sure if um you know magazine uh distribution is maybe dropped below podcasting but what i've seen since falling in love with the medium honestly 20 years ago is Every year is podcasting's biggest year. Every day, people form a new kind of audio habit. Um, thank you, True Crime, for being a gateway drug for so many people for that reason alone. Um, and for this particular type of content, we've, we've seen how the most successful ever climate anything media has so far been a movie about a comet that doesn't say climate once. Um, it's really hard to do climate media, um, but it's less hard, I think, in audio without constraints like podcasting than any other medium because you can't help but feel a connection or form a connection when it's well done with someone who's speaking in your ears. Um, so it's, it's the widest door we have available to us for climate storytelling through the ears than anything else. So, um, yeah, a, a one line is podcasting is going to keep growing. If you want to be a huge name, it's hard in podcasting. Um, if you want to develop a huge audience, it's hard in podcasting. But if you want to um, help a small group or, or a, a group of people who self-select and really care about what you do, then podcasting is the place for you.